According to the Guttmacher Institute, in 2023, more than 60 percent of all abortions in the U.S. formal health care system were done using abortion medication. But in reality, that number could be much, much higher. A new report from the Journal of the American Medical Association, known as JAMA, shows that most women who chose to self-manage their abortions in the six-month period after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade obtained their abortion pills outside of the formal health care system, particularly from the networks of volunteers that quickly mobilized and expanded after that 2022 decision overturning Roe. Now, some of these networks are here in the U.S., but others are in places like Mexico, where networks are packing and shipping abortion medications, sometimes for free, to women in America who are trying to circumvent their state's harsh abortion bans. In the process, these networks are also increasingly witnessing a secondary reality, an alarming rise in sexual violence against migrants on the Mexico side of the border, one that is leading to unwanted pregnancies here in a post-Roe America. This is a special report from MSNBC contributor Paula Ramos. We're about to talk to a young asylum seeker who was sexually assaulted on a Mexican border town and then found out she was pregnant as soon as she stepped into Texas. The only reason she agreed to talk to us today is because we will not be disclosing her identity or where we are right now. When Valentina left El Salvador for the United States, many of her friends cautioned her against it. They knew about the harrowing experiences of women heading north. Te Una vez, múltiples veces. Sí, fueron varias veces. At what point after entering Texas did you find out that you were pregnant? Al mes y medio, porque como toda mujer esperamos nuestro periodo. Mm -hmm. Entonces, nunca llegó. Y yo pensé como que fuera como puro estrés por todo el camino, por todo lo que claro. pasó. Ya luego se me vino como que aquello a la, a la mentecita, como que, ¿y si estás embarazada? Valentina found herself in Texas, pregnant, alone, and planning an abortion. Were you aware of the strict abortion laws that are enforced in Texas? No. Entonces yo fui buscando información en Google, videos y todo, y en Facebook grupos de personas que la vendían y todo eso. ¿Y qué did you learn? De todo fue como que apuntaba como en Texas no puedes hacer nada. Were you looking for clinical help? What did you want? Mi, en mi cabeza siempre estuvo como comprar las pastillas. Lo veía tan fácil como que tomarme una pastilla y ya. The pills Valentina is referring to are a combination of mifepristone and misoprostol, the FDA-approved regimen for medical termination of pregnancy. More than 60% of all abortions performed in the United States are done using these pills. But since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022, 14 Republican-led states, including Texas, have banned the medication. Habían como muchos lugares donde conseguirlas, pero no te enviaban a Texas. Valentina found a group that was able to ship the pills to a friend's house in a nearby state. At 14 weeks pregnant, she found herself packing once more, this time to carry out a self-managed abortion. Weeks after she returned to Texas, Valentina managed to obtain more packs of misoprostol, one of the abortion pills she used. Inspired by her own struggle, she decided to break the law to help women in similar situations. Were you aware that what you were doing was illegal? Siempre, siempre estuvo consciente como de la manera ilegal que era todo. Tengo dos opciones, o me daño mi récord o ayudo. Y yo pues dije, no, pues prefiero ayudar y que sea lo que pase. Do you have any left right now? Sí, eh, ayudé cuatro personas y queda una es la restante. Are you still thinking about helping other women? Ya el, esta etapa allí yo creo que ya está cerrada. Mi última dosis se la di a una chica de acá en Texas mm -hmm. que vivía como a 40 minutos de mi casa y me dijo, pues mira, fíjate que voy llegando y estoy embarazada, necesito una dosis. Yo le dije, OK, te las voy a ir a dejar. Valentina says she's no longer providing abortion pills. But on the other side of the border, activists are working day and night to fill the void. Hola. Hola, ¿qué tal? Te habla Paula Ramos. 
Hola, Pao. <laughs> this is Evelyn, a young doctor from Mexico City who's part of an international network helping women obtain both mifepristone and misoprostol. Since the overturn of Roe v. Wade in 2022, much of that help is being routed to Texas. She asked for her identity to be concealed in order to protect the operation. Approximately how big is this network? How many people are part of it? Somos ahorita actualmente como unas 15,000. Wow, 15,000 personas. And who are they mostly? Where are they contacting you from? La mayor parte mujeres migrantes. Y por diferente contexto social se encuentran en un embarazo no deseado. Es decir, que son mujeres que están aquí mismo en la frontera donde estoy yo. Ajá, justamente. How many packs of pills are you sending each week? Mm, cada semana como unos cuatro o seis. How do you hide these pills? How do you make sure that no one knows what you're mailing? La manera discreta en la que solemos enviar lo que pasa muy desapercibido, pues es en toallas sanitarias, en un sobre y así lo enviamos. I think many people would ask, what's in it for you, right? Obviously, you're not doing it for economic reasons. So why do you do it? Mm, lo hago pues porque entiendo. No, completamente la realidad de ser mujer. Y creo que el poder ayudarlas, el poder justamente ser ese sostén en este momento tan, tan crítico es fundamental. Back in Texas, Valentina feels the same way. You really risk your life and ah. your status. Why? Porque sé lo que se siente estar allí yeah. y no tener ayuda. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, for her part, was not having any of this. She suggested that the remedy here, with getting rid of mifepristone for everybody, was ridiculously broad especially given the highly unlikely and as yet totally hypothetical harm that could be done to this group of seven physicians and dentists. Counsel, can I ask you um, about the remedy and sort of the way that I was talking with the SG? I mean, it makes perfect sense for the individual doctors to seek an exemption. But as I understand it, they already have that. Um, and so what they're asking for here is that in order to um, prevent them from possibly ever having to do these kinds of procedures, everyone else should be prevented from getting access to this, this medication. So why isn't that um, plainly overbroad uh, scope of the remedy the end of this case? From that question, we finally, finally got Ms. Holly's central argument as to why national restrictions must be imposed to shield these seven doctors. These are emergency situations. Respondent doctors don't necessarily know until they scrub into that operating room whether this may or may not be abortion drug harm. Because these are emergency situations, they, they can't waste precious moments scrubbing in. Uh, no, scrubbing no, 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 I'm saying, I'm saying assuming we have a world in which they can actually lodge the objections that you say that they have. My question is, isn't that enough to remedy their issue? Do we have to also entertain your argument that no one else in the world can have this drug or no one else in America uh, should have this drug in order to protect your clients? So again, Your Honor, it's not possible given the emergency nature of these situations. Counsel, let me, it, let, let me interrupt there. I'm sorry. That was a real argument before the Supreme Court today that mifepristone has to be banned for everyone after seven weeks of pregnancy because emergency room doctors don't have time to wash their hands repeatedly. We will have to wait until June to know what the court thinks of that. Jessica. Yeah. Scrubbing in and scrubbing out. It's just too much for doctors, therefore no mifepristone for anybody. I mean, I, was, I found it appalling, but... Also shocking, if you that, that can even be possible. You know, I almost didn't find it like shocking or surprising because the group of doctors that they brought forth with this case are such an egregious, radical group of anti-abortion extremists. This is very much who they are. They don't care about patients. They don't care about women's health. This is a group, one of the, the doctors that they have involved in this case, this is a group that wants doctors to be forced to give women with life-threatening pregnancies C-sections instead of abortions, 
that's how radical they are. And I really don't want that to get lost in this conversation, that these doctors, they're not run of the mill. This is not one good faith side of a political debate. Yeah. I wonder, Carrie, when you listened to the I'll call it skepticism from the part of some conservative justices. Do you feel like this case, and I'm just going to limit to this case because we'll talk about the broader landscape for, for reproductive freedom in a second, but do you feel like Josh Hawley, Aaron Hawley, I shouldn't say Josh Hawley, Josh Hawley, Aaron Hawley's husband, uh, but Aaron Hawley is making a case that goes anywhere with this court? It didn't sound like it. It sounded like the court was prepared to dismiss the case on standing. The standing is so weak, mm -hmm. but not just the standing. The facts are weak. The science, the law is weak. This case is weak across the board. It's absurd that it's even before the Supreme Court. Mifepristone, as you said, is so safe, safer than Tylenol. It should be over the counter. It's been highly restricted simply because the anti-abortion movement has been pushing from the very beginning to restrict access to prevent people from being able to access the drug. So, it, it, you know, I'm hoping that the court will dismiss it, but the anti-abortion movement will not give up. They will come back. The Project 2025 has promised that if a Republican president gets into office, that he will direct the FDA to pull Mifepristone from the market or at least restrict telemedicine abortion, which has been a key way that more people have accessed abortion. So they're not going to give up even if the court does dismiss this case. Dahlia, why did the court take this case up? Is this, is this damage control post Dobbs? I mean, what was the point of this? Was it to just give Clarence Thomas what he wants, which is absurd hearings on any manner of social issues? Not, not exactly. The court has a, a structural problem, and the structural problem is that anybody who wanted to file this case could go down to Amarillo, Texas, where Judge Matthew Kaczmarek is the, it's like putting, you know, your quarter in the candy bar machine. The only judge you were going to get in Amarillo was Judge Kaczmarek. And then they knew that after getting him, he'd do something incredibly dopey, like file a nationwide injunction, making it impossible for anyone in the country to get this drug. And so we have a forum shopping, a judge shopping problem in this country that I should note the courts are trying to address now. But for the moment, the court has the problem of one rogue judge, a rogue Fifth Circuit that blessed huge chunks of his irrational, indefensible logic. And the court had no choice but to take this case. And so I think as long as we have kind of judges that are way, way, way to the fringes, judges who make Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas look like kind of centrist moderates like they did today, <laughs> those cases are going to rock it up to the court and the court is going to be embarrassed. And they were embarrassed today. And they're going to have to take them and bat them away. So that's just a problem with judge shopping. It's a problem with fake facts and, as Carrie said, bad science that somehow makes it into the court's lap. And then the court has to sort of muck out the stall. The statement was made that no court has ever previously uh, second-guessed uh, the FDA's judgment about access to a, to a drug, right? And it's never second-guessed that. Th that's correct. Do uh, you think the FDA is infallible? No, Your Honor. We don't think that at all. And we don't think that question is really teed up in, in any way in this case. Do you think the FDA is infallible? That was Justice Samuel Alito's question today in the Supreme Court case that could determine the future of medication abortion and also the future of drug approval in this country. The FDA, after all, is the federal regulatory agency that approves new drugs in the United States. And this case calls into question whether the courts should believe the FDA when it says a drug is safe. Justice Alito's skepticism there tells us a lot about the court's conservatives, and it suggests that they may be thinking about something much bigger than even abortion, namely whether conservatives are going after the regulatory state on whole. Right now, right-wing judicial activists have brought a series of cases that threaten to upend 40 years of Supreme Court precedent and hobble the federal government's basic ability to enforce laws. Those lawsuits are trying to limit regulators' ability to enforce everything from laws against insider trading to laws that protect the food we eat and the air we breathe. Back with me are Carrie Baker and Dahlia Lithwick. Dahlia, let me first just talk to you about this. This case is obviously about mifepristone, but it really is about whether we believe the FDA, as Alito says, is it infallible. I mean, 
Do you think this court is prepared to go get into it with big pharma? I, I mean, that's the question. It was very clear from Justice Alito's questions today, not only that he wants to second guess the FDA, but he really wants to stake a claim that you know, the, the maker of these pharmaceuticals is money grubbing and greedy and doesn't want to know how dangerous their product is so they won't do the studies. Like there's a real kind of, of sly dig over and over again at Big Pharma. Um, but Big Pharma is so profoundly arrayed uh, against uh, Judge Kaczmarek's uh, uh, crazy order because you can't test drugs, you can't uh, create drugs. You can't do anything if one person objecting in South Dakota can get the entire uh, uh, medication pulled. And so this is in some sense an easy case for a big business court that really wants big pharma to win. But I think under your question is this harder question, which is this entire term has been a kind of deregulatory juggernaut where the court keeps usurping to itself the power to decide what clean air looks like and decide, uh, you know, how how bureaus work and to decide, uh, you know, how fishermen uh, have to enforce uh, uh, fishing rules. And, and, you know, this is of a piece with that, this dripping contempt for federal regulation. And the most interesting moment, I thought, um, after Justice Alito said that question about, you know, are they just, are they infallible? Uh, Justice Katanji uh, Brown Jackson came back very quickly with, are we best suited to make like deep dives on science and scientific regulation? Because this is the pattern that we see in this court. They're here to tell us what the Clean Water Act looks like now. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you, Dahlia, that moment where it's like, Wait, does Sam Alito know more about ulcer medications than the FDA? I mean, you know the history of this, Carrie. This drug has been regulated more than most drugs on the market. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. I mean, it's heavily restricted. The FDA has based all of their decisions on voluminous science. The idea that judges who have law degrees, who have no medical background, no research background, are better at assessing the science than the experts at the FDA is ridiculous. But that's the role they're, take, they're trying to take for themselves. Dahlia, they're, they're looking at the Chevron doctrine, which is the sort of foundational like decision that, that undergirds a lot of regulatory power in the United States. It allows the federal government to basically do its thing, if you will, in layman's terms. Can you talk a little, I mean, can you talk a little bit about what your expectations are for the ruling in that case? Because it had kind of massive effects on, you know, American life writ whole, much, much more than just one sort of single reproductive freedom issue. I mean, the Chevron doctrine is just a simple uh, uh, sort of rule that says we defer to agencies' own interpretations of how their laws work. We don't second guess the experts and the scientists and the accumulated years of expertise because we're a bunch of judges in robes. And as Carrie just said, we don't know a lot of stuff. And as you said, that is on the chopping block this year. And in some sense, it comes hand in hand with the major questions doctrine, which is another doctrine that isn't a doctrine and has no sort of roots in anything shallower than sand. And it's another rule that the court has given itself that says if, a, if something is a big deal, for instance, President Biden's uh, loan forgiveness plan last year, then we get to decide on that, too. So we're seeing the court with this utter lack of humility go from agency to agency and pick off, uh, as you said, the notion that agencies can enforce their own rules in ways that are reasonable. And even in some cases to say, oh, that's just too big a deal. And so we're going to decide on that too. It's a way of both kneecapping the federal government, how government works, and also of giving to the justices themselves almost unbounded authority to decide how we live. Yeah. I mean, Leonard Leo, who's in many ways the architect of this conservative court, says the hard left likes the administrative state because that's how basically they get their, their social safety net established. And that is who this court is going after in a big way, not even hiding its intentions. Dahlia Lithwick and Carrie Baker, thank you both so much for your time and expertise. Really appreciate it. 
Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.